Welcome to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. In-depth conversations and opinion covering a variety of topics from the world of news, sports, and more. Here's Mike McFeely. Welcome to another episode of the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. I believe this is number four in the comeback tour, whatever you want to call it, um, after I sort of canceled my own podcast. I've been through that a million times. Don't need to go through it again. Um, We talked in the podcast last week about how my readers and listeners suggested what they want this to be, and it was mostly they wanted it to be casual conversation with smart people talking about many different things and just sort of going all over the place. But one of the things that they did specifically point out to me, numerous people did, was you need a female voice on there once in a while. And so last week, if you remember, and if you listened, thank you, we had Tracy Briggs on. And Tracy, as we pointed out in, I didn't, but Tracy made sure to point it out that she was actually the second choice last week, a last <laughs> second choice, because Tammy Swift was, and I don't, I don't want to make Tracy feel bad, but Tammy was the person I turned to first in our building when people said you need a female voice because she's, and again, not that Tracy's not popular, but Tammy's a very popular, award-winning columnist, and she's a female. And so I thought, heck, let's get a female (laughs) on since people are asking for it. Tracy filled in last week because Tammy got busy last Wednesday when we recorded it. She made time and did not get busy today on this Wednesday, one week (laughs) later. And so after that completely discombobulated, unnecessary introduction, I want to welcome in forum columnist, reporter, personality, and female, Tammy Swift to the McFeely Mess Podcast. Hello. How are you? I'm great, Mike. Thanks. Was that the longest introduction you've ever had? Ah. Yeah, probably, but okay. I I was fine with it. I'm glad to bring some estrogen to <laughs> to McFeely's mess. It, it <laughs> it's it's an odd thing um, because you know I'm I mean I you know have a mother. I have three sisters. I have been married for twenty seven something twenty five twenty six twenty seven years. Uh-huh. I have a daughter, and so I'm surrounded by females mm. in my real life, um, and I found it. I guess, not disconcerting, but sort of like, oh, yeah, that I didn't really ever have any females on my podcast in its previous incarnation. So right. So you can add all that you can add to well, this podcast. you probably have a lot in common with my brother, because he had four sisters, and he was like the lone man, he and my dad, in this very estrogen... <laughs> Stranched <laughs> household. So, where were you in the birth order? I was going to say, so is your brother the youngest? He was the youngest. So, it was like the second coming of the king. Oh, my God. Is it, was your that you? Your brother and I have to get together and talk about how great oh, life was. My gosh. Growing up in our homes because I am also the youngest sibling. Oh, my and gosh. And so, um, just ask my wife, uh, incredibly spoiled. <laughs> yes. My entire life. Yes. And for whatever reason, and God rest her soul, my mother, who we'll get to later in the podcast, because mm-hmm. we want to talk about some things you've written recently, for whatever reason, and it, God, I was lucky that this happened to me, but my mom thought I could do no wrong. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it was, it was I was in a, and it just still pisses off my sisters to mm-hmm. this day. Yes. Because, I mean, I've had my ups and downs in life, um, some self-inflicted, others not. But for whatever <laughs> reason, my mother just thought that I was had a halo and I was an angel and no matter what I did was was, was right. Oh, and my yeah. sisters would just grind their teeth just like I know. As my mom's like, oh my it's like and she's just my sisters are just like <laughs> Totally the same thing. Okay. Uh, you know, my brother Gary, you know, I just always envisioned that each time the doctor came and said, Well, Virgil to my dad, it's another girl. I just imagined him just being crestfallen, like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, four <laughs> girls. And then all of a sudden, here comes the king. And I mean, it was a big day in dun, our house. Yes, absolutely. And still, my mother just raves about everything Gary does. So he is, he's really our celebrity well, in our family. I've never met Gary, but I know this that all of the praise thrown his way by your mother 
is well deserved yes. and accurate. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's no way she's biased. No, not it at all. It is a completely he, he unbiased has earned view. every accolade. <laughs> he really from has. Your mother. And he is a nice guy, so I have to give him that. Yeah, he I'll, is a very good son. I'll take your word for it on that, but it <laughs> really doesn't matter. He could be the devil reincarnate, and I'm sure that he earned every accolade absolutely. from your mother. Absolutely. Speaking of your mom. Um, well, you know, before let, before we get into that, and it's, we're going to get this is going to be kind of serious. We've kind of been chatting it b- before. It may be the saddest yeah, McFeely well, podcast ever. No, no, I, no. no, I don't know that. I mean, I, it, it's going to be. I, I think when we get talking about what we want to talk about, it, there's going to be a lot of people who identify with it. Yes, you know? absolutely. I mean, I, mean I, I have my moments of of. Uh, Political opinion. I have my moments of sports opinion and anal- uh, analysis. I have my moments of comedy at times. I have, I wear many hats. Um, I don't know that I'm often deadly serious about anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can't take things too seriously no, nowadays. And so, and so we, we, but it's going to, we'll get to that. And it's going to be, I think, an interesting discussion. But if people, Especially those who listen or read me have not read you or or listened to you before. Introduce yourself. You are uh, a, a now a business reporter and a longtime columnist for the forum. But just walk people through what you do here and what you've done previously. Well, I mean, I've been working at the forum in some capacity since like 1986, if you can believe it, as an intern. And um, I mean, that was the year you were born. So, (laughs) um, again, (laughs) we're the same age. And so I think I I think I started in 86 or 87 here as well as an intern. Oh, okay, Awesome. Well, you know, I was probably too scared of the sports desk, so I probably never. A lot of testosterone. Too much testosterone. It's very frightening people. Yep. Yep. And um, I've just always kind of kept one toe in the waters of the forum. I've worked at different jobs. Um, I worked at, you know, Lutheran Social Services of North Dakota, all kinds of different stuff. But I always pretty much maintained a presence at the forum. And I wrote a humor column or sometimes humorous column Mm -hmm. for I mean, it's been like 30 years. So I have a long time connection with this place. And um, I came back in 2021 and um, they needed a business reporter. And I never thought I'd be a business reporter. And I'm actually really enjoying it because I I get to write a lot of uh, business features and human interest stories, which is what I love. I think business reporting would be fun. Um, yeah. th- there's a lot of fun beats at a newspaper, in my opinion. I've always yes. been kind of the sports politics guy. That's kind of my, and outdoors, so I do everything. Um, it's sort of been my world. But business reporting um, is fascinating just because yeah. it's like a, it's just a whole different world. I don't always understand all of the, the jargon and all, but just people want to read about businesses. They want to read about restaurants. They want to read about um, restaurants. They want to read also about restaurants. <laughs> it's and so true. They want to read about restaurants closing as well. <laughs> yes. And so it, yes. it, there are there's so much interest yeah. in in the business world. It is amazing. Like if Taco John's is in the headline, <laughs> that bad boy, <laughs> which, which, it's going to be a home run. <laughs> I don't care what it is. You know that or Josh Dumel. Those are home runs instantly. What does, for you, I, I know what the Josh Dumel thing says about us, but what does the Taco John's thing say about us? Let's let's break this down. What does yeah. the fact that Taco John's, which it, Taco John's has played a part in most of our lives, if we are from this area mm-hmm. and if we went to college, perhaps, especially yep. in this area. I went to what was then called Moorhead State, mm-hmm. the Taco yep. John's on Center Avenue. <laughs> My freshman year was a a center of my life uh, for various reasons, mostly inebriated uh, <laughs> late night, early morning reasons. Coming out of mix office, Woo! yeah. Uh, there yeah, you go. That's a whole different thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, but anyway, um, I'm sure that you never did any of that. Oh no, uh, I was at prayer meetings. Um, but wasn't constantly. It said that Taco John's is like a thing for our readers. I do think it's the nostalgia. It's the. Um, it just seems sort of special to us, you know, like mm-hmm. in other parts of the country, it might be Taco Bell or whatever, but Taco John seems to have kind of this sort of unique 
regional cachet and then the potato olays. Yep. I mean, we could probably just do a series of podcasts on the love of the potato olay. So, which is truly a special, unique food that you it really is. can't find at any other type of uh, fast food Mexican restaurant. So, I grew up in Alexander. I, I graduated high school in Alexandria, Minnesota. I actually was born in the Twin Cities, moved to Alexandria in what was then called junior high school. Um, oh, yeah. One of my VFW baseball coaches growing up, okay, we went to a Taco John's on the road somewhere. We were in, what well, doesn't matter, Wadena, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't make any difference. But he ordered, you know, whatever, two super burritos. And being that he is was a Norwegian from Alexandria, he pronounced it, and give me an order of potato olis. Oh my gosh, I love it. And I, I kind of was, <laughs> and I was like, you know, 13 years old, and I kind of went, <laughs> and went, oh God, he doesn't know any better, does he? <laughs> I mean, he's serious. He's serious. He was he, potato olis, and I went, uh, well, okay. I, uh, you gotta yep, love it. Get, Only yep, around here. Yep. That was so awesome. Yep, it is. I love it. It is. <laughs> Um, one more thing before we get to the serious topic of the day. You write a lot of humor columns, and you have won many awards for your, your humor columns. I've written this before in my weekly newsletter that you can sign up for, by the way, at our form, uh, Inform website. But humor writing, to me, is the hardest form of writing ever in the history of mankind, and there will never be a close second. Yeah. If you're talking between two professional writers, and maybe listeners don't give a rip about our difficulties, <laughs> but I can write opinion, I can write tear jerky, I can write straight news, I can write a satire, I can write 15,000 different things. Trying to write humor is the hardest thing to write hands down. Agree or disagree? Um. I agree, but I think when I started, I had no idea. I mean, if someone, I'm glad you didn't tell me that 30 years ago. I mean, because I just, you know how it is, you're just sort of a dumb kid, and I'm just like, well, I kind of like Irma Bombeck and, yep. you know, Dave Barry, so I think I'll just sort of write like that. And, um, and then I have sort of a jokey family, and, um, my dad loved telling funny stories, and so I just sort of, you know, grew up kind of immersed in that. And then, um, yeah, so I'm just glad I really didn't know what I was doing <laughs> because. So you're saying, so you don't think it's that hard? Well, because I did. I it came. I think it is now. I think after 30 years of coming up with columns, it's really hard okay. actually because, like, my life is not as funny now. <laughs> I mean, it was funnier when I was young and well, I was. Well, that's true. Yeah, I was I mean, dating and I was doing all these. You know, I had my stupid cat and I did all this stuff. And now, you know, it's like, well, now I'm a middle-aged lady sitting on my couch. I mean, I'm not as funny. <laughs> So, and I don't have kids. I think kids are a huge grist for the mill for, for humor oh, yes. writing. Oh, yes. And yep. Because you can always be the, you guys be the dumb dad. Yeah, exactly. Or the clueless mom. I mean, that's or just whatever. endless yes. material right yes. there. And I didn't have that. And okay. so, you know, it's a little bit harder now. And I think also the world is so much more serious now. And there's it's a little scarier. And so I think it's a little harder to write now. I've always just thought that. Humor, first of all, is very subjective, right? I mean, oh, I mean that, that's, that is part of, of the difficulty of it, mm -hmm. is that what I think is funny, some people think is funny, and others look at you like you're from Mars. You're exactly. Like, what? what? Yes. Um, I've had people, multiple people, who just happen to be of the conservative persuasion, tell me that they just don't understand this Tony Bender. And what oh, is he? Yes. And it's like, I'm going, well, first of all, he's effing hilarious. He is, yes. And they're like, he is? Yeah. Well, yeah. They're not I, seeing so it. I said he's a fantastic writer. He, you consider that fantastic writing? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's like, he could be syndicated. He's really freaking good. He is. He's and fantastic. And they're like, yep. oh, I just don't see it. Right. So the point that I'm trying to make is what what's funny to me might not be funny to you. What's mm -hmm. funny to you might not be funny to me. And so when you're trying to write humor, at least in my case, I sit back and go, okay, like every paragraph is, okay, is that funny? Yeah. 
I know. And, and when, I, when I'm writing a, a normal column or a normal straight story, I can flow pretty well. When I get rolling, yeah, I can, brrr, it's, it's stream of consciousness. I can go. I just write. And at, at the end, I go, eh, yeah, good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, humor, I'm like going, okay. Ba da da da, ba 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 ba. Uh, I know. I don't know if, I don't know I if know. that's funny or not. And is it appropriate? Is it is it too subtle? Yeah. Is it exactly. too cheap? Exactly. Is it, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I used to do a lot of, is everyone going to get this? Is everyone, you know, I tried to be very mm-hmm. universal. Yep. And kind of more in my later years, I'm a little more like, you know what? The people I want to get this will get it, which probably sounds really arrogant. But mm. it's like, it just no. gets very hard to write something that absolutely everybody's going to find hilarious. But because everybody Be, won't. Because they won't, no. regardless of what you no. do. Yes. And so um, I do a lot more of that. Um, like for me, if I can make myself laugh at something I've written, then I feel like, okay, it might be pretty good. But there are times you turn stuff in and you're just cringing because you're like, God. Ugh, Correct. Yep. This is supposed to be funny. I feel like I failed. You know, yeah, you don't always no, feel good about it's, it. It's, it's, it's hard. It is. Humor's hard. It is. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it, I reached a point of my life, not even so much my career, but my life where I just write things sometimes just to please myself. And right. If, if I write yeah. a joke that I think is funny, if I'm yeah. writing a humor column and I, and I have a line and I go, you know what? There's going to be four people maybe <laughs> who understand that gag. But you know what? Yeah. I don't give a shit because I think yeah. it's funny. My sisters <laughs> and my friend yep, yep. who knows me really well yep. are going to find this yep. funny. Have, Nobody else I have is. literally written lines that I yeah. know one person will get. Yes. And I'll go, God, that's. That's too good. I got to write that. And then right. that person will text me the next day. That's hilarious. <laughs> Nobody else. And I'll just go, I win. That, this that one's was... for you, Jim. <laughs> I love it. So, I I've reached that point of my life where I just, I care more about me yeah. than anybody else, which is, you know. <laughs> that's probably <laughs> that's probably why my columns aren't as funny either. I'm probably just writing very self-absorbed stuff. No, no, no I don't know. I don't they're know. They're fantastic. Oh, no, thank you. Okay, let's. Let, let's get away from humor okay. um, and talk about what I wanted to talk about with you. And that is recently you've been writing, um, I guess maybe getting back to the mm-hmm. topic of your mom. Yeah. And the fact that she has had, I'll let you tell the story, but in general, um, your mom had a pancreatic cancer. Yep. It went into remission for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And it unfortunately recently returned. Yes. And so just tell that part of the story, flesh it out a little bit, and then I want to get into some of what you've written about it in a couple of recent columns. Okay. Well, I think in 2019, my mom was diagnosed, and she was one of the very rare few with uh, pancreatic cancer who discovered it super early. People usually don't have any symptoms until it's too late, but she was super attuned to her body, and she knew something was wrong, and they found it. And when we heard that... We were terrified. We were like, Mm -hmm. this, you know, it's a death knell. I mean, you always hear that it's like one of the worst cancers you can have. And you always hear about people who like die two or three weeks after they're diagnosed or even days after they're diagnosed. But um, my mom is a strong German lady and tough. And she went through chemo. She went through everything. She went through this thing called a Whipple surgery, which is hell on earth, where they basically remove a bunch of the stomach and... And she survived all of it. And uh, when she was done, the surgeons were so proud of themselves. They said, you're not going to have cancer. I mean, you, you're going to have five years cancer-free, guaranteed. Mm. And How old is your mom? And she w- was in her 80s at that time. Okay. And Oof. so, and then she started getting weird um, symptoms again this summer. And it had only been like three years since the surgery. Well, they went in and they found another cyst on her pancreas or what remains of her pancreas. And so she is fighting it again. Um, but she is much, she's older. She's much weaker. She's had a lot of actually other health problems caused by the treatment for the first round of pancreas, you know, know, radiation, Mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, they discovered a heart problem. And so she's just, um, it's been a really painful 
battle this time around, and we don't think she'll be able to do surgery. But we're trying to do chemo, but she gets very sick from it. So it's just a long, sad story, kind well, of. And your writing has come from an angle of that your family is now d dealing with this return of of the cancer, mm -hmm. and it's it's sort of your reaction to it, you write a lot about your mom, of course, but there's a lot of self-reflection and a lot of what you think about this and how it's affecting you. It's, yep. it's a, your personal column mm -hmm. and how it's affecting your family and just sort of the observations that you've made as your 86-year-old mother is going through this. And 86 is an elderly person anyway. Right. And that's, you're getting to a point, if, if somebody's 86 years old, you're sort of thinking, well, you know, they're 86 years old and, you know, this is, it's something's going to happen at some point right. here anyway. And you combine that with the return of the cancer and it's, it, it's given, you're writing this, as I read it, I, I keep shaking my head because I've been through some of this, and we can get to that in a second. But it, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of as if you've had to, like, deal again with what you were dealing with a couple of years ago, but from a different perspective. Right. Three, four years later, and and have a different outlook on it completely just because of the time that's passed. Exactly. It's. I mean, I have to admit, it's a less hopeful view. It. It just mm -hmm. seems like. Um, it's probably not going to end up like it did last time. I think it would be un unlikely. I hate to even say that mm -hmm, yep, out loud. Yep. But um, so it's also making me deal with end of life and what is it really like to lose a parent? You know, we've talked, we talked about that. It's mm -hmm. like you think, oh my God, you know, I'm middle aged and I'm a, a big girl now, and this shouldn't be a problem. You know, this, I mean, look at all these people who lose their moms when they're like kids, or, mm -hmm. you know, what am I doing whining about it? The woman's in her 80s, and I'm finding that it doesn't really matter. It still hurts like hell. It still does. Yeah. I lost my dad when he was uh, 66, and I, he had me, he, he and my mom had me later in life. They were in their 40s when they had me because mm -hmm. they, they wanted a boy. My dad wanted a boy. And so they- Before the miracle trial We don't need to came. get into the details, but, yes. they, but they wanted a boy to put a halo on. <laughs> yes. Um, and I was that guy. <laughs> um, and it still hasn't left me, by the way. It's still, you can see it right here in the room glowing. <laughs> it is, it's um, bright. But, I, but my dad had a, ended up having a, a bad heart, terrible heart condition, uh, died when I was 21. Um, and so I lost my dad when he was 21. But my mom um, continued. And uh, she was a, a very feisty, I would say, woman. Um, <laughs> you know, That's had a, not surprising. <laughs> stubborn, feisty, opinionated. Mm -hmm. um, that was my mom, so I don't know where I get that from, but that might be <laughs> it. Um, but but she, she lived until uh, she was 94. And wow. she just died uh, last year. Yeah, and it was, and she was in actually really good health until mm -hmm. the last year or so. Mm -hmm. And even then, it wasn't terrible health. It was just, it was just obvious that she was ninety four years old, yeah. and that she was, you know, things were starting to happen. Right, and we were going to a place, as you've discovered or that you've thought about, that it's just inevitable. Right. Um, but I read a line in one of your columns a week or so ago. And when I read it, I went, oh God, I gotta talk to Tammy about this. Yeah. Because she's because it she gave a thought in one of her columns that I just went, mm-hmm, this is coming your way. Mm -hmm. And the line is, it comes toward the end of a column a couple a week or so ago, and you're talking about your mom's um, potential death, and you say you feel a little less safe, mm -hmm. half orphaned, mm. um, a motherless child, at age 58. Yeah. And I that hit home with me. Yeah. And I'll, your dad is still living, mm -hmm. right? And yes. so that's why you say half orphan and right. a motherless child, not a parentless child. Right, right. Um, I happen to be 58. Actually, I'm 57. Going to be 58 this fall. Um, but it, I will tell you that when you lose a parent, and, and it's different now, 
Mm-hmm. When I lost my dad at 21, it was just it was just a shock. It was oh, like yeah. I just uh, it just right. was, I had no You're still idea. A kid, I was you know? just a stupid 21 year old, mm-hmm. you know, drunk six days a week. Had yeah. no idea what I was doing. Had no idea what life was. Uh, right. And you just sort of stumble your way through it mm-hmm. and come out the other end and go, well, Jesus, I, you know what now? But you get through it. When my mom died a year ago, and I was 56 years old, that's a whole different feeling mm. and it was the and you and I've written this but you can she was 94 mm-hmm. and so you think well it's you know nothing goes on forever she was 94 she lived a great healthy life her mind was sh- I mean her mind was sharp mm-hmm. until the second that she was no longer conscious I mean I'm talking right. sharp yeah um, but she just made that decision that it was time to to go but when she died it it is the strangest feeling, even as a 57-year-old man, mm-hmm. that y- you walk away from that moment and you sort of process and you realize that you are, as you wrote, you're an orphan. Yeah. And it is the strangest goddamn thing. Yeah. And I, I'm not trying to... to make you feel anything by telling you this and this is a really personal conversation that we're having in public but but <laughs> that's fine. maybe there are people out there listening who have been through the same thing it is the oddest feeling because even as a full-grown adult with a wife and a child and a career and i'd like to think a somewhat successful existence in this world you're all alone yeah exactly it, well, it, it just how, how how did you come to that phrase or come to that, that that way of thinking? I think, like, I mean, to be completely candid, like when my sister first called me and said, it's back, I actually, I feel like I became like a four-year-old. And I think I even talked like a four-year-old. I think I said something like, I don't want to lose her. I mm-hmm. kind of said in this baby voice, because it just hits at the core of who you are. This is the most important person in your life for many years. And like my mom is such a center and probably the case with your family too. My mom is kind of the center of our home. I mean, she was always super domestic, big Christmases. You know, she would pass each other, each kid Um, she'd pass on information about the other kids. Instead of us talking to each other, (laughs) mom was like the information clearinghouse. She was a town crier. She was totally the town crier. I mean, she is so central to who we all are. And when that's gone, it's like, now what? Who do I call for a apple crisp recipe? Or like, well, how do I know if this, how to fix this recipe? Or, you know, who to talk to about this? You know, that person doesn't become less important as you get older Mm -hmm. you know and so just the idea like what is a christmas going to be like without mom what is you know Mm -hmm. are we gonna i suppose we won't have a house anymore you know i mean all the things that you associate with family and home it's all different Mm -hmm. you know and from a from a personal perspective the odd feeling as i've thought about this even as it was happening i was thinking what is what's what's going on here i'm i'm having these feelings that i've never had before i I don't have feelings i'm 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 a man man. (laughs) i have no i have no feelings even though my last name is mcfeely yes i I, 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 i'm cynical i'm a hard-boiled columnist i don't like humans yes i'm a man rhinoceros skin yep i'm a tree bark for my skin just you know whatever but i found myself thinking part of it I think a big part of it is is the mortality. I mean, it sounds yeah. stupid, but it's but but that that chapter of my life that lasted all fifty seven at that point years for me. Mm-hmm. That chapter was then closed. Right. You know what I mean, like like, right. like that never that again. book cover just slammed shut, and that's like, well, I I'm now the other generation, and there's no generations yeah. prior to me in my family left because my dad is gone obviously my grandma and grandpas have been gone for decades Mm -hmm. Uh, and when my mom died it was like this finality Mm -hmm. um that i never expect i didn't think i didn't think i was going to think that way Mm -hmm. yeah i knew i'd be devastated 
even though she was 94, I knew that I was going to be crushed. I knew there was going to be emotions. Mm-hmm. I knew there was going to be tears. All of those things happened. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't expect this odd feeling of, well, oh, wait a second. I, I'm, you know, me and my sisters are now the only ones left. Yeah. And that chapter is gone. And that branch, if you will, of the family is gone. Mm-hmm. And it, it goes beyond just my mom is gone. My mother's gone. Right. You know, it's like a whole different odd, empty feeling. And I literally think I went, well, I'm an orphan. And you and you can laugh at that. Yeah. And, and you can make jokes, but that's fine because we're really not orphans. We're, no. we're full adults. But, but you feel that way. Right. You do. It's like, I think I had said something like this platform that keeps you up, uh, with these, these shared experiences, the fact that you're under this family tree, that is just starts to give away and you're like, well, now what, you know? Mm-hmm. So how did, can I ask how you did after your holidays, like your first holidays? Oh, it's it's odd, yeah. right? I mean, it's... Like a very glaring, you know, yeah. absence, yep. I'm sure. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just odd and, and it's in the... You know the little the little messages or the the little the phone calls once in a while. You know yeah. that, that when that that that's odd to get over that part of it. And um, she lived in the Twin Cities in Maple Grove. Okay. Um, and she just got in a new apartment recently before her death. And so I still go to the Twin Cities quite a bit for other for business or for pleasure. And I could always count on when I went down to the Twin Cities. Oh, I'm going to pull off and. You know, see my mom for a bit or what? Yeah. And then it's like that's like losing any parent or any yeah. any close person is, you know, you drive by and go, oh, that's right, I, yeah, I can't stop and you know, yeah, I, I can't stop in because she's gone exactly. And so exactly. that 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 you know, you go through all of those stages, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah. it just it just the, the finality of it, as dumb as that sounds, again, as because she was ninety four, and you knew it was coming, and you could see for the last year of her life that she was, just getting way slower and yes. way the you know the thoughts weren't quite always meshing like they had and she was always real sharp and so but that but it's just the the word orphan is the one that stuck out to me yeah I, I thought i was the only one that was thinking that way yeah but apparently you're thinking that way too i think a lot of people do really when you get down to it even though we don't want to admit it so yeah so yeah, yeah i mean we're just we're old people <laughs> I know. I'm not, I think that's... I'm, not a, I'm not a young person, and I'm having these feelings, which is that's that that was the odd part for me as well. Right. I know. It's like when you're a kid, you think, God, once you're 21, I mean, you've got it all figured out. That's how. That's a little kid's perspective, and I think you think, God, by the time you're in your 50s, I mean, nothing you've seen bothers. It all, right? Yeah, right, yes, you've nothing seen will it all. bother and, you and, anymore. And we've had, we've all had ups and downs in our life. Yeah. We've all had things happen that you just you have to get through in mm-hmm. life. You have to power through them or get through them however you can. Right. Um, Because we've all, we're just experienced people. We're not 17 years old where life is woohoo. Yeah. You know, and so to have something like that happen at at 57 or 58 um, was sort of an eye opener. Yeah. It yep. is. And I think even because you have more perspective by the time you're in your 50s. So you're like, you know, maybe when you were 21, you probably just went and drank or something <laughs> to get through yeah. it, yep. you know, and yep. kind of made a joke or, or, you know, whatever. But now it's like, you know, this is huge. This is mm-hmm. a big loss. These, This is a very important person to me, yep. you know. And the other so. part of it is, and this is maybe the, the, the selfish outlook on it, is there's also the idea of mortality there. Yes, absolutely. Right? I mean, as, as long as your parents are alive, yeah, you're bulletproof, right? You're still I mean, a kid. You're still a kid. Yeah, you're still yep. You're still you're still yep. you're still Olga's little boy. Yeah, even though you're 57 <laughs> years old. Yes. And when that's gone, then all of a sudden you go, well, not only am I just part of the family remaining, but I'm next. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Exactly. You know? Holy shit, I'm next. Right. I know. And I mean, I've even, you know, I don't have any children. And so it's like, am I going to be the crazy old aunt who, you know, <laughs> like the nieces and nephews kind of have to draw straws to see who has to take care of crazy Aunt Tammy? No, you're going to be the fun Aunt Tammy. I hope so. And I'll probably gonna, still that, be writing that, columns. That, that, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not digging ditches. Oh. We can... We can write the words until we're, you know, drooling out the side of our mouth. Exactly. So, yeah. So we'll be fine. Um, God, this is I, 
I hate to even bring this up, but uh, yeah, my wife and I the other day were talking about our, you know, estate planning and things like that. Oh, so God. that's. Oh <laughs> God. I know. Let, let me put up the air quotes. Estate planning. <laughs> yes. that, that's the technical term, uh, but the, the estate planning. Yes. So, For so, all your millions and oh, all your land. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Well, I am a baron. I am a land baron. Yes. The land baron of North Morehead. <laughs> Who isn't in journalism? That's true. You know, we're all very, <laughs> very wealthy. That's why we got into this profession. Elites, you know? The elites, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a degree from Morehead State, <laughs> and I'm a. And yes, you. And I'm a sports writer or a, or a columnist. So it's, yeah, yeah mm, doing real well. Me too. I, I, I do just fine. I've I had shouldn't. the same job for yeah, how many yeah, years? I, yes. Yeah. I, I, they formed me very well. I need to be clear of that. Yes. They're, they treat me very fine. Yes. Right. Yeah. So are you going to continue to write about this? I think I'm going to have to. You know, I always have to kind of respect mom, too. Like, part of me is like... I don't want to overshare because I want to yes. be respectful to her. But at the same time, I got so much response to this column, and I just feel like so many people need this right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a very painful passage. And so, I mean, if I can speak my truth and, and other people can relate to it, I'm going to keep doing that. Is it, do you feel it, and this maybe the cliche word is cathartic, do you, do you feel it helps you to write it? I do, actually. I felt very, like, I felt whole after I wrote it. I felt like, okay, I said what I wanted to say, and, um, yeah, I think I think it'll help some others, and it, it certainly helped me, so. Isn't that one of the odd things about us as as writers is that we, we are willing to share some of the, the most innermost thoughts that we have and some of the most personal thoughts that we have. I and know. Many others are not willing to do that. No. In this world. And for whatever reason, we creatives, as they might call us, as the kids call us today. Right. We feel this. I've done the same thing. I'm writing my newsletter uh, that's going to go out tomorrow is uh, an incredibly personal newsletter. Mm. Um, uh, And it just and it's I don't know why. Why do we feel the need to share these things? And not everybody does. Yeah. Um, as, you know, people out in that room, our newsroom out there, that would not write some of the things that you and I have written. But yes. I, why do we feel this need? Well, I think, I mean, if you do a column and you're not willing to be vulnerable, then don't do a column. I mean, you really have to kind of put yourself out there or nobody's going to want to read it, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And sometimes just... It's so freeing to other people if we put our humanness out there, you know. Um, it's like saying, hey, it's okay to not be perfect or, you know, to feel these things. And I think it's actually kind of a service to people. Um, but then at the same time, there's other people who find it cringy, you know, like, oh, I don't, you know, don't, yes. don't get all personal with me. Um, and, I, you know, I've gotten some of that, too. But... Um, and I've had vulnerability hangovers, too, you know, like where you're like, oh, my gosh, why did I say that? You know, afterwards, <laughs> you're like, I just revealed way too much of myself, you know. Ooh, okay. All right. But it's all just part and parcel of of being a colonist, you know. You just yeah. got to take those risks and be real. And- I, I, think that, I think that's a good word. I think I think taking a risk is what's – I think that's a – you know, you can, you can go through life or go through this profession and be a columnist and never – write anything particularly meaningful yeah i you know i can i can hammer doug burgum seven days a week on his political views or his ridiculous presidential campaign (laughs) or his toe sucking of donald trump and that's that's all fine and it'll get reaction out of people but i think at some point as a columnist you have to show some vulnerability and you have to take a risk with what you're writing right and i and i actually and we're getting again to the writing weeds here, but I actually enjoy that sometimes where it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write this and I don't know how it's going to turn out, but let's just throw it out there and see what happens. Right. And sometimes the feedback is so much better than you ever thought it would be. Correct. You know, and, I, actually, and it's sometimes it, surprising. Actually, I would say most of the time when I feel like, eh, do I really want to say this publicly? Most of the time the feedback is like, Wow, that was really awesome that you did that. Mm-hmm. It's it's not you know shut up you're a jerk. I'm a, I always get that stuff no matter what I write because I yeah. I'm a jerk, um, <laughs> and that's fine. That's that comes with the territory. But most of the time when I've written something that I I kind of went eh, I don't know if I should hit publish on this or not, and then I do, 
the feedback you get is, you know what, that was pretty nice. Yeah. You know, that was a good job. Well, I think, too, with you, you put sort of a tough persona out there. So I think people might find it actually kind of a nice change to be like, oh, okay, McFeely is human, you know? Well, wait a I second mean, here. That's not, I don't want that well, to happen. Yeah. He's not a robot. <laughs> so, no, yeah. I, no, I'm not a robot. I'll, I'll, I will say that. I, I'm not a robot. Oh. Um, good. That was nice. Thank you. You bet. Ken, this was thanks fun. Thanks for doing this. I this know wasn't that you. Uh, as terrifying as I, I thought it would be. I was going to say. I was just going to say, you were a little bit trepidatious <laughs> about doing this. I was. Um, yeah. You're not a. You're not a radio person, mm. as I once was, um, and so I can just. I can sit down and crack a microphone and BS my way through two hours and not even blink. Um, yeah. Which is insane because in college I was the most introverted person in the world, but that's whatever. But uh, you did a great job. Thank you for Thank you putting for yourself me. out there. You bet. Both with your columns and talking with me. And thank you for, um, with your writing, allowing me to read it and go, God, yeah, I'm not okay. All right. I wasn't crazy then. Nope. <laughs> not on this one. I, I, I thought I was crazy. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Okay, we're, we're done here. <laughs> okay. as, as Jay Pritchett would say, we're done here. Okay. Thank you. Tammy Swift, <laughs> forum columnist and business reporter, joining us this week on the McFeely Mess podcast. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with a guest that I don't know who it's going to be yet. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening to the McFeely Mess podcast at Inforum.com. For more podcasts and columns, head to Inforum.com and search Mike McFeely 